Hello, everyone. Welcome to All Things College and Career, the podcast to turn to for all of your college and career planning needs with your hosts, Meg Gary and Bobby Ryan. You came to the right place to gather as much information as possible about college and careers before you make any big decisions. We are so glad you are here to learn before before you leap leap each week with with us. Today's guest is Dr. Robert J. Doran, a general surgeon who just recently completed a five-year surgical residency with two years of research sandwiched in the middle of that. And now he's currently doing a fellowship at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento, California. Yes, he's currently working on minimally invasive surgery, bariatrics, and robotics. Definitely on the cutting edge, so to speak. (laughs) Bad pun right there, but we'll use that. (laughs) Why not? Today, we talked to Rob about what it takes to become a general surgeon. Yes, Rob walks us through his entire journey from undergrad to work at Boston Children's Hospital to medical school to his five-year surgical residency to research and now his fellowship. That's a long road. (laughs) It's a long road. Unbelievable. And Rob was so gracious in this podcast sharing just exactly what it takes to become a general surgeon. So for anyone out there considering a career in medicine, thinking about applying to medical school, or if you're interested in becoming a general surgeon, then today's podcast is for you. Yes, it sure is. So enough of our introduction. Let's get on to our conversation with Rob. Let's do it. Hello, Rob Doran. Welcome to All Things College and Career. Thanks so much for doing the podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Good morning and hello. Well, good morning for you. Good afternoon for us, but hello. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Rob Doran, we are really excited to talk to you today and have all our listeners learn all about becoming an MD. So where are we talking to you from? I'm currently in Sacramento, California. So this is what I know about Sacramento other than it's the capital and an amazing and beautiful city. But I also heard it's like the most hipster city in California. (laughs) (laughs) Do you care to comment? (laughs) Yeah, so I've been out here for, this is going on my eighth year in Sacramento, and it's actually really changed a lot since I've been out here. Um, Has it? Yeah, lots of people moving in from the Bay Area, San Francisco area, and the Palo Alto, the tech areas, because the cost of living is so expensive and Sacramento right. has been relatively inexpensive. So it's really it kind of been booming <laughs> over the past five yeah. to eight years, a lot of growth. Wow. But, would you say in a good way or not so good way? Uh, obviously, I think a good and bad, right? Because <laughs> yeah. when, we, <laughs> when we first moved out here, the cost of living was a little bit less. Okay. And now with, you know, more and more people coming in. It's driving uh, prices from up. those hot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Well, hopefully it levels out a little so it doesn't get too crazy. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Rob, we like to start our podcast by asking our guest if they could tell our listeners three things they love about their job. So maybe you could share with us three things you love about your job as a general surgeon. Yeah. So I'd say three things would be, you know, the first, obviously, I think most people share is any sort of specialty as a MD is being able to help your patients and people. So I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, no matter what specialty you choose, I think everyone does that in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, But surgery, you know, what I love about surgery is that for me, I specifically get to (laughs) figure out a problem and then you really can fix it relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, And for me, I really, it fits my personality. I find a lot of gratification in being able to do that. Problem solve. You know, relatively, yeah, Yeah. relatively short basis. It must be so rewarding to get people out of pain or fix their problem. You know, that must be so rewarding. Yeah. I mean, it's very fulfilling and helps to keep you coming back and saying when you're working as much as doctors and surgeons do. I right. Bet. You have to have something that gets that energy going and that motivation for those long hours. All right. Yeah. So what would you say the third thing is if you had something in mind? Oh, I thought you were going to let me get away without it. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> see? See? No we're on top of this, Rob. Yeah. We're uh, keeping track. Yeah. <laughs> we're laser um, focused. <laughs> no. yeah. I think he knows um, better than that. Yeah. Anyway. (laughs) You know, I think another thing I really was thinking about it before we started our conversation is, you know, picking surgery, it's, it's a really long road. Mm, (laughs) Yeah. But uh, what's really neat is I've had like, in a way, it's almost like a couple different 
careers in one. The schooling itself, it's four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, and then residency, which can range depending on the specialty you choose in surgery. It's quite a while. So it's like, I've been at this for a, you know, forever, what, almost 18 <laughs> years. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But, a long and time. I'm just, it's an I'm insane just amount of time. signing my first job offer. <laughs> yeah. so it's, and it's congratulations like on offer. that. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. just, yes. that is amazing. Congrats. And, you know, speaking of that, we want to just kind of turn back the clock a little and see where it all started. So for young people listening or any age that are interested in going down this path to just see kind of what it takes. And I know you had a pretty successful high school career. You would never admit this on a podcast, but I can say it that, you know, you were in the top (laughs) 10 of your high school class and you were a standout athlete and you worked really, really hard. So was that step one, you know, to having this really tough career to break into? Yeah, I would say when you look back now, you can kind of see the trajectory. But yeah, I think it definitely starts there. I can't say that when I was in high school, I knew for sure I was going to go into medicine. Mm -hmm. I just knew that I liked the sciences. And to be honest, I think math was my strongest subject really? <laughs> going up through school. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, when you look back, I actually applied more to engineering schools from high school, but uh, I kind of kept options open and ended up going to a liberal arts school and, and then following that path. I mean, especially now, I think just exposing yourself to as many different things in high school is definitely the way to go. Definitely, because you're so young, the more you expose yourself to, the more you have an idea of what your interest might be, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and what I think is interesting is that there's probably not one 18-year-old coming out of high school that's saying, okay, I'm willing to spend the next 18 years of my life (laughs) (laughs) to become a a surgeon and to get to the way you are today, Rob. So I think a message here for me would be that look, it's just a one step at a time thing. Yeah. You you know, and you could have chosen many different paths, but this is the path you chose. I think when you talk to kids about, you know, why don't you become a doctor? And they think, well, I don't want to go to school for 10 more years or 18, (laughs) depending on, right? It's a good argument. (laughs) But I think, (laughs) yeah, it is. But I think the the mental space you have to be in is just go one step at a time. Or follow your interests or your, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So interesting. So you picked Stonehill College in Easton, Mass, I believe. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe because Bobby's son looked at that school and he was somewhat interested in engineering. So maybe... He was going to do a 3-2 with Notre Dame, I believe. Oh, yeah. They had that. So Mm -hmm. maybe that's why you picked it, Rob, thinking if you decide to go the engineering path, that would be an option there as well. If you look back at all my choices, I kind of always have chosen things that would give me multiple options. Yeah, and <laughs> good. I mean, even even as you go along, you I got more specific, but even choosing general surgery, it still provides you. <laughs> yeah, there's with, that word, general. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like, so it's don't, like, don't every box step, me in, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and I think it might be a little yeah. bit of a problem I have, but it also <laughs> has allowed me to kind of keep a variety yeah, in what I chose awesome, and keep it going. And so I remember that program was available for engineering through Notre Dame at Stonehill. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so that which was is a great program. Reasons. That's a great program. You know program. what's interesting? Speaking of you committed 18 years to education, basically. And one of the reasons my son was like, oh, mom, five years of school versus four. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. For engineering. Do yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm yeah. thinking to myself, from my perspective and age, it's like, oh, that's just a blip yeah, on the radar. A, but, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, Rob, for any listeners that might be interested or researching Stonehill, could you just tell us a few things about Stonehill? I know it's been a while, but not that long. Yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's, uh, it seems like another lifetime, to be honest. But for me, again, kind of along that theme of keeping your options open, I felt like, you know, I came from a relatively small town in mm-hmm. growing up in Maine. And I just at the time going to a big school just didn't really I don't think fit with Mm -hmm. where I was at at that time in my education and what fit me anyways, socially and everything. So I just felt like it was far enough from home, but not too far. It provided a good science background, liberal arts. It had that engineering option as well. So it gave me a little bit of time to To figure figure out exactly what I wanted to do. And, you know, it was close to Boston and everything. Yeah, which is another big plus. Yeah. And you ended up being a biochemistry major. Is that right? Yeah. So I think they kind of make you choose something your first year. And I think I had chosen biology at first, but after, you know, being strong in math and liking math, I found chemistry as well to kind of fit that. So that's one of the toughest majors. 
majors too. Sure is. That's such a hard major. Yeah, that's impressive. So did you also do some research there, Rob, at Stonehill? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how it's changed since I've been there. But at the time, the biochemistry degree required a like undergraduate thesis. So in that, you had to do a research project. So I did that. I coupled it with going abroad in college. So I went to London and stayed six months and did research at a hospital there. And it was kind of my first exposure in a hospital setting for an extended period of time. So what was your initial reaction to working in a hospital? Uh, It was pretty cool. I mean, I got to experience another country. They spoke English and obviously the languages aren't one of my strengths. So (laughs) so it was nice to be somewhere where they spoke uh, English. Right. Um, yeah. And doing, you know, a research project made that a lot easier. But yeah, the hospital, what I remember <laughs> most was I actually got to hang out with some surgeons and shadow in the operating room. No um, kidding. Wow. There for a couple of cases, which so just talking about them, I can still picture the uh, cases that I sat in on there. Wow. Um, so that was your was first kind of, taste, really? Of Yeah, that was like my real taste of like some big surgeries. And I just thought it was pretty amazing. Right. So right away, you knew that, first of all, you could handle being in a surgery environment because yeah. that's not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, and, right. sure. And it piqued your interest. It drew mm-hmm. you in. So it was telling you something. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What surgery, or I know you saw a few, but like, which one really stuck with you? Yeah, the big one that I watched was a parotidectomy. So the removal of okay. the parotid gland on the face, which was, wow. you know, I'm not even, crazy. I don't know what that is. Sorry, Rob. What What's the oh, parotid so gland? <laughs> the parotid gland is a salivary gland. Oh, it's okay. Like I know that one. <laughs> be, yeah, it's located <laughs> be, like between the your okay. earlobe and the corner of your mouth. All right. Um, yep. Like on the angle of your jaw. So did they have to like peel the whole skin back and everything? <laughs> yeah, well, it was interesting. It was so difficult that they ended up having to make a cut through the jaw in the midline oh, of wow. the face and open up the mouth that way. Oh, and so wow. it was like, it was very... <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, wow. I wasn't expecting that. It was kind of grotesque, but it but was pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah, after, I mean, then this lady mm-hmm. was put back together and just had a, a scar on her chin. Right, um, after so all that, pretty, right? Yeah. <laughs> just a little scar on her chin. So yeah. Yeah. your dad had a business grandpa's workshop at one time. So is it pretty similar being a surgeon to being a carpenter kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's easier. It's easier. It's easier. It's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it sounds um, like a lot of sawing and I chopping think, in there. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah oh, I mean, I think gosh. there's definitely some similarities some and things you can yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that you can draw off of, you know, my experience in watching him. Obviously, owning your own business and the work hours are pretty, can yeah. be actually fairly similar. That's true. So I, yeah. I think I think I saw what kind of hard work was all about from a young oh, age. Oh, that's so, so true. Yeah. So I think that was one thing that was pretty helpful. And then, you know, obviously, yeah, I mean, you're kind of building things and taking things apart and putting them back together. So, it, right. you know, you're using your hands. So yeah. it is a, in that respect, it's similar. I love that you say so, it's easier though. That's awesome. I know. Your dad <laughs> probably would love that. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right. So you're at Stonehill College and you're graduating. So what did you do next? How did you decide what to do? Yes, I think (laughs) at the (laughs) end of, again, seems like a really long time ago. um, That was about 11 years, 12 years ago. Or no, actually more than that, like 14 years ago. You're the math guy. Um, You're going to have to do that math. I I think it's, yeah, it's about 14 years. So at that point, I was leaning towards medical school, Mm -hmm. but I still wasn't exactly sure. And so I kind of, you know, looked into it a little bit, but wasn't really quite ready. I believe I actually took... I was going to ask, did you take the MCAT? I took the MCAT. Yeah. I took it at the end of my fourth year of of undergrad. Yeah. But I didn't do as well as I wanted to do on it. And I think after the fact, realized I didn't really like prepare (laughs) adequately for it. And (laughs) there wasn't really... It's a kind of... You know, it's the end of, of undergrad and I wasn't quite <laughs> ready. It wasn't your yeah. top focus. To take it. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't apply and I had met a former graduate from Stonehill that was running a lab at Children's Hospital in Boston and Harvard. So I ended up doing an internship at the end of undergrad as well with her lab. Mm. And that kind of worked its way into my position getting a job. Yeah. uh, yeah, And you were there for a couple of years, um, right? Yeah. So instead of applying, I figured it was probably worth taking some time, enjoying a couple of (laughs) years after between, you know, before I 
See what, what it felt like to earn some money instead of yeah. spending money. It almost <laughs> seems like not right. studying. It seems like night. medical schools look right. a little favorably on that little break as well, don't you think? Yeah, around when I was looking was really I think things started changing. Where traditionally medical school is like you do your four years of undergrad and then you go right into medical school. Mm-hmm. But I think it's really changed over the past decade or more. There's a lot more what they say, Mm -hmm. non-traditional students and people going back to school for a second career or taking some time off working, seeing if they want to do something else and being like, no, you know, medicine is what I want to do. And so the med schools feel more comfortable and sometimes look more favorably on those applicants. Yeah, and you can see why, because you tried other stuff and you came back to medicine. Right. So Mm -hmm. that shows commitment and being a more mature decision, I guess. But yeah, so that's what you did. And that seemed to help you out. So then what, you decided to take the MCAT again? Yeah, so I think I had about a year working. And within that time, I think I started studying a little bit more focused for the test. Mm -hmm. and then took the test so that I could apply. It must have been around that end of that first year Mm -hmm. uh, to med school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, got into a couple of schools and decided to go to uh, University of Buffalo. Right. So why did you pick Buffalo? So I got into a few schools. And to be honest, the primary reason I ended up on Buffalo, well, I guess there are two. One, my best friend from childhood was there already. (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) And uh, so I knew about the school a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then uh, also financially, because I mean, you know, embarking on a medical school and choosing this as a profession, you really delay your chance at earning money. So the financial cost of medical school is pretty steep. Exactly. And Buffalo, I don't know if they still do it, but at the time you could become in-state resident after one year. Yeah, and Maine didn't uh, have a state. Right, because the state of Maine, yeah. Didn't have a state school. Yeah, right, so. Right. I think think they have an arrangement with Tufts now, but they didn't have that available when you were applying. Right, yeah, and I think more so the primary care specialties, if you know going into med school that you're really thinking about a primary care Mm -hmm. specialty, you tend to get a little bit more or financial help when you choose those tracks. Oh, really? Is that because there's a demand for primary care specialists? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. I wonder if that's still the case. Check it out, people, if you're thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good tip. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about what medical school is like? Or maybe just back up just a tad and just if you sure. could say a few words about what the application process is like, because I know that is just, it's a lot, right? Interviews, right? Yeah. It's probably like really <laughs> expensive, <laughs> too. Kind of, yeah. So I, it is, yeah, all of the above. I, it's definitely Every step of the way is kind of like its own task. Right. <laughs> its own of, monumental task. It can be a little task. overwhelming yeah. If, you, yeah, if you don't kind of break it down and get help from other people and ask people that have gone through it to give you feedback and pointers on how to handle the process. But I don't think it's changed a whole lot. I think since, you know, there's obviously... For the application process, there's certain prerequisites that you have to take care of for courses Mm -hmm. through undergrad or postgrad courses. And then the application process itself, it's all online. There's fees that go along with it. I think people usually apply to a pretty large amount of schools. I want to say, depend on the candidate, but I I think people usually do 20 to 30 schools. Because Um, the odds of getting in are, because it's so selective. It's so hard to get in. Yeah. Right. And then I think probably you hope to get maybe a third of those as offers, maybe. Like as interviews, yeah. And and then all of those don't pan out to be admits, right? Right, right. So there's like no pressure. Average. Yeah. (laughs) Sounds awful. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, the first part is to do all that and pay for the application process. And then the second part of it is you get interviews and then you got to pay to go interview at the yeah you you're know, flying all over the country or yeah. Or, yeah yeah um, yeah just so when you feel so wealthy right <laughs> yeah right. all kinds of extra money oh, yeah like, yeah, yeah yeah exactly it's so that's tough but, yeah that's yeah tough. there's several people that have you know if the finances really are difficult the military are always an option mm-hmm. yeah providing exactly. you means to do it financially. Right. You know, you obviously owe them time after finish your training, but there's a lot of people in our program because we have a big Air Force base nearby okay. that have done that. Mm. Yeah, that's a great option and a great tip for people right. out there that, that is a great tip. overwhelmed by the cost. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about the interviews a little bit. Like, what's a tough question they ask you? <laughs> 
Oh, jeez. This is so <laughs> long. <laughs> I would, so I would say one big tip is yeah. I always, it's funny because now I tell people this all the time because every step of the process, there was always those doctors that would be like, are you sure this is really what you want to oh, do? Really? Like, <laughs> don't you like, you really like, don't do, don't do medicine. Like, don't choose. You want to be a surgeon? Are you like crazy? Yeah. Like, What's do you the matter really, like, with you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so yeah. it's so funny. I used to get really mad because like every step of the way you run into those people and you run into the doctors that are like, I would never choose anything else. And like, this is the greatest job right, ever. Right, right. Like, sometimes I'm not sure if they're really being honest either. Right, but, yes. Because, uh, The, the you truth know, probably it is, lies it somewhere jo- in between, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's a, it's a job, too, right, at the same time. Right. And it's a very important one and very gratifying, but it's also a job at the end of the day. Um, yeah. But the, <laughs> I always found that so fascinating that, is that the, so many people every step of the way would say that to you, whether it was in medical school, residency, or not, re- but before medical school applying and then wow. in medical school. So um, how would, you, would, say that. How would and, you handle that question? Well, I look back on it and I was like, you know, it actually is really a interesting. Be- <laughs> well, and and I felt like you know what, I ended up choosing this. And if just some person I meet one time tells me that, and I still decide to continue on, and I'm not discouraged by telling me that this is not a good choice, or (laughs) like, why are you crazy for doing this? Like, and I still do it, then I must have really I made the right choice. Yeah, right? Exactly. I love that. And yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so now I'm that guy who tells these, you know, yeah. these Young pre-medical med students. students. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they come in, they're, you know, they're volunteering in the hospital and they're like, oh, wow, you, you know, you're going to be a surgeon. Like, I want to do that in the future. And I, it's funny because I kind of preface it to them. I say, you know, honestly, like, this is a really long road, right? right. And if this is what you want to do, then that's fantastic. But if you find something else that you are really happy doing, like you, you should probably, you give should that choose some that. Look. <laughs> all, right. all, things that being, look. all things being equal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, yeah. and I'm just meet like, I'm just meeting these people for the first time. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm like, if I can convince you not to do medicine, then it's not the right. That's so true. Yeah. That's you. so true. You right. should, you know, it's funny that you bring this up because we had a podcast with, this um, is what musicians. I was thinking of too, Bobby. <laughs> And these two musicians, Adam and Michael Scharf, who also have a podcast called Mentoring for the Modern Musician, they produce, they record, they do everything. Anyway, when people come in and ask them for advice on entering the music industry or having a music career, Adam says, he asks them. He's he like, says, run for your is life. Is there anything <laughs> else you can do? He says, is there anything else you can do? Is yeah. there anything else out there at all that you could be doing other than this? He says, if they are adamant that this is what they're going to do, then he says, all right, Many, then you're a musician. Right. He said <laughs> nobody could have talked him out of it, you know, no, as much no as way. they tried. Right. Yeah. yeah, because it's a long, hard road as a musician. Right. You know, and it's a long, hard road to become a surgeon. It sure is. Right, right. So I guess I didn't quite answer your question on a tough interview question, but I feel like... No, I like that answer. That was a great answer. I loved it. (laughs) Yeah. So can you tell us just a little bit about what it's like to be in medical school? Yeah. So medical school also seems like a long time ago, but... uh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. We're getting closer, uh, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah. Medical school was only I finished about eight years ago, I guess yeah. now seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, between seven and eight years ago. So med school was four years. I was at Buffalo. It was great because I got to live with my. I think living with somebody I knew uh, yeah. in a different place was from that aspect was great. So I had some support on that side right, of things. Somebody that had um, just been through the ropes that could be kind of a mentor right. for you. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. So that was definitely a benefit. But the schooling, I mean, it's tough. Uh, some schools are a little different. The way Buffalo was set up was two years of classroom lectures, basic science and clinical science lectures and more traditional education. Mm-hmm. Some schools, you know, get you involved clinically a little earlier. And all of them get you involved clinically with some sort of uh, in some capacity interactions in yeah. the clinical setting. Yeah, yeah. some capacity. Thanks uh, <laughs> yeah. from <laughs> from the start. But it was really like two years of that, and then those two years for me, it was a lot of studying. Everybody 
is a little different. I'm sure some people didn't have to quite study as much as I did, but overall, it's it's a lot yeah, of studying hours and, hours and of tests. Studying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How about the competition? So we have a brother-in-law that's a doctor, and mm-hmm. he said he recalls. I I love this story. <laughs> I, I was very young when he told it to me, so it just sticks in my head. He said, "Oh, the competition was brutal in that school." He said, "You know, you'd be in the lab, and something would blow up next to you. You don't even look up. You don't have time." <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's funny. I would, I, I would just, say, yeah, I, <laughs> I would say that is pretty. You know, yeah, it does actually remind me. I mean, the first two years, especially, I feel is it is actually pretty competitive. It's kind of like high school all over again. Yeah, you're like yeah. with the same group of people, twenty four seven. Yeah, right. For like right. in the, yeah. I mean, four to six hours a day in a classroom. Plus studying, Mm -hmm. it is pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would, yeah, you're right. I think that after that initial couple of years, Mm -hmm. things are a little less competitive because you kind of are out in the hospitals for the next two years. Yeah. So is um, is that when you take your first round of boards after the first two years? Or yeah. So most places you take your they call them the step exams. So the I think the USMLE step one is your first big exam in med school. And that's a national standardized test that pretty much there's a little, quite a bit of pressure that goes on that because I bet. Yeah. You're, yeah. all the residencies really use that as kind of like a benchmark. It kind of determines what residencies you're eligible for, basically, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't want to close any doors, yeah. <laughs> you really right. you you want to do well. Yeah. You kind of have to, you got to do pretty well. Which, on that res- first so exam. Which residencies are the toughest to get, would you say? So traditionally, orthopedics, dermatology, ophthalmology, and then those are kind of, I would say, those are the top and then surgery comes in all the different surgical specialties kind of fall in under those Mm -hmm. and then obviously kind of all the programs are tiered same as like undergrads you know your harvard and johns hopkins and those schools are going to be kind of rated towards the top super hard to get into yeah yeah, so which residency program yeah i see yeah that does sound so a lot of pressure to do well on those Initial yeah, boards, that's all crazy. The boards, but yeah. So mm. after that, are your final two years more clinical, and you're in different hospitals, and you have a couple more step examinations, or yeah. So then your final two years, and again, some med schools are a little different, but it's mm-hmm. generally set up like this: is those last two years are primarily clinical, and you'll rotate through all the different specialties. So internal medicine, family medicine, surgery, and in surgery, you may do some of the subspecialties, and then psychiatry. I think those are the big ones that I'm not sure if I'm yeah, forgetting yeah, something. Yeah, well, that's but, okay. So through those rotations, is that how you decided that surgery was what you were leaning toward? Yeah, I just found like, every step of the way I would end back on surgery. Mm-hmm. Like when I was thinking about what I enjoyed the most and what I kind of gravitated to, it just seemed like even when I was back in Boston, when I was working at Children's Hospital, I was doing research in the lab, but I would end up going in and watching surgeries with the surgeons that were in the lab. And oh, no kidding. I chose that yeah. over going to hang out with the gastroenterologist or the, <laughs> right. you know, the neurologist. Right. And not that those right. weren't interesting, but it just seemed like every time I had a choice, I ended up in the operating room. Wow. And, mm, uh, yeah. and then the same thing in medical school. There was some advice they, I can't remember who gave it to us, but it was like, basically, you know, even if you think you know what you want to do, enter every rotation with an open mind and like thinking yeah. about, okay, is right. this something yeah, that I would, that's such you know, good could advice. see myself doing? Try to give it a full give chance. It yeah. Open-minded yeah. chance. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Cause you never know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, cause <laughs> I mean, the other thing is you choose medical school and you really, I mean, you can shadow and work and have an, unless you like have a parent or right. a sibling that is a doctor and you have like upfront experience, you don't really know. And even then you really don't know what it's all, mm-hmm. what it's like until you, <laughs> until yeah. 18 years until later. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now you know what it's like. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now you know for sure. Now you know. And now our listeners are going to learn from you. So, So, Rob, you ended up selecting a five-year general surgical residency out at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento. So, interestingly enough, you took a little break after three years in your residency to do some research. So, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about 
what your residency was like and what prompted you to step back and do a little research before you just recently finished up. You completed Yahoo. your five years, <laughs> yeah, which is a huge accomplishment. Yeah. And now you're doing a fellowship in, um, let's see, bariatric minimal invasive. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'll let you talk about yeah. that. But <laughs> but no, if you could just first... <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but if you could just first touch upon your residency experience and the research that you did in the middle of that. Yeah. So you come out of med school and you go into your intern year. So the first year and you learn that you've done all this preparation and education and they pretty much just strip you back down to nothing. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> yeah. You, are, nothing. Yeah. you are nothing, you know yeah. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like um, and then over, lowest person in <laughs> the get, totem pole at that point. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it's a humbling experience I bet. Um, mm. as you kind of build yourself back up, you know, over those five years. But yeah, I think just so f- people don't know, I mean, residency, you do get paid. So it's a job as well as a training. Which is a huge relief, you Um, know, I'm sure after paying out tuition for eight years. Yeah. Right. So just so, yeah. (laughs) But I think if you, if you calculated what you get per hour, it's probably not that much. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So Because you work so many hours as a resident, right? Yeah. Hourly, you're you can't really calculate it because it's <laughs> very depressing. <laughs> you don't want to know. Yeah. It's not a number um, you want to calculate. Yeah. yeah, but you work anywhere from sixty to a hundred hours a week. Oh my um, gosh! Throughout Yikes, your yeah. residency, That's a lot. Um, yeah, it's a lot of hours. So it's you like know, pledging a frat. <laughs> <your life>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, no uh, sleep. Yeah. You Still going to perform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you, right, you definitely, uh, definitely. All right, uh, not an exact analogy, I but mean, it's kind no, of No, no, basically it's, it's very much, <laughs> <laughs> very much a fraternity. <laughs> oh, that's um, funny. No, yeah. uh, or a sorority. Or yeah. Yes, um, right. But sorry, what were we yeah, saying? No, <laughs> we were talking about Nobody how knows, you were, no. you did your first year, you were an intern and then you. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that you're at the bottom of the yeah. tonal pole. Yeah, you yeah. got stripped down to yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, every year of residency is a little different, and your responsibility every year really increases. And your last couple of years, it's increased a lot. You're basically in charge of a team that you're on. So those first three years, you get some experience. You you know you got to work with a team. You got to learn how to operate a little bit. You got to mm-hmm. learn how to not sleep very much. And then also when you're not at the hospital, you got to take some time to do something fun and spend time with right. your family so yeah. that you don't go right. crazy. Yeah. Um, a little which balance. Is important. So yeah, those first three years are interesting. They're all different because I think that first year people don't expect you to know anything and they don't. It's like, you know, you're kind of taught that mentality of it's actually safer if you think you don't know anything. Yeah, yeah, that makes uh, sense, actually, because they're going to so teach you, you at least yeah. know right. when to or, ask or. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And no, and that's exactly. So you just want to, I mean, obviously, you know, things as, uh, as in your first yeah. year, but yeah, always bumping things up to your senior team members so that you can go over things together and learn from the clinical scenarios. And then your second and third years, you're kind of learning more how to operate and but still learning clinically and then those last two years you're really refining your operative skills and kind of being the leader of the team you're on mm, wow. right do you have the title like chief resident or something like that yeah is there so, a title that goes yeah yeah so i traditionally the titles of the years used to mean a lot more when it was like decades ago when residencies mm-hmm. were super competitive and they so-called like pyramidal where you basically had to fight for your next year oh, wow. <laughs> to be yeah. able to go. So you start off with five interns and only three of them could move on oh, or something like wow. that. And wow. then it ended up with in the final year, there was only one or two chief residents or something. And, uh, mm. But now we kind of just use the term chief resident is kind of held over. And once you're in your last year, you're a, a chief resident. Right. So you're saying that pretty much you can stay in your residency program these days as long as you're doing well. I'm sure right, you have right. to have some level of performance, but it sounds like you will not get tossed out yeah. as easily as you used to. Yeah. No. Yeah. Once you've got a spot when you come in, as long as, again, there's tests every year and then there's board exam at the end. Uh, tests every years. year. Um, wow. I, uh, it just, I just the pressure can't never take ends. It, these big tests. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it never yeah. ends, right? Yeah. They call them in-service exams. So each specialty has a test every year. 
that you take. Mm-hmm. So no matter what specialty you choose, medicine, surgery, any of the specialties. But the point of them is to just prepare you for the final yeah. board exam. It's more of a benchmark okay. for your or program an incentive to, to be keep able to say, hey, or- we need to... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Or like, you know, we need to specifically help you because falling behind or things like that. So it lets you know where you are. So that's good. Like you need Um, to brush up on this area or you're you're doing really well in that Mm -hmm. area, so to speak. I'm just curious, how many surgeries would you say you've done over the course of five years? And what was your craziest one or most interesting, I guess? Yeah. So you keep track. There's a logging system for all of your procedures and cases because, well, first of all, to finish your residency, you have to satisfy a threshold number of different types of cases. And I think I was around like 1400 or something um, like that. So when you come out of a program like that, you've had a lot lot of training, a lot of exposure. Right. Yeah. They're all a little different too. I mean, there's university programs, there's community programs, and the focus will be traditionally some of the community programs are much more operative Mm -hmm. based and less variety. Whereas like a big university, you're going to rotate on all the different specialties within general surgery and get a more variety of of Mm. cases. Yeah, so that's interesting. All kinds of different environments to basically become a general surgeon and experience different types of surgeries. Do you have a surgery that is most interesting or sticks out? Sticks out, yeah. Um, There's quite a few. I can imagine. I I would say one that really sticks out to me. I guess this one's good. So UC Davis is a pretty big trauma center for Northern California. Mm -hmm. Uh, We cover a huge geographic area in Northern California. So we get people from all the way up near the Oregon border down towards like just north of LA. So we'll get people in from all all over the place. And uh, I was a second year and a landscaper got shot in an argument or something and oh, came boy. in and had yeah. been operated on. It was, I was in the ICU and the patient got to the ICU. He wasn't doing well. And we ended up taking him back to the operating room and the attending and the fellow were on one side of the patient and he started just crashing. <gasps> And oh, they're on boy. one side, I'm on the other. And they hand me the knife and I'm only a second oh, year. Second <laughs> year. And I opened up the right side of his chest and, oh. you know, this guy's whole chest is open, heart out. They're massaging his heart <gasps> to keep him alive. Wow. And, I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm like, this is this in is my crazy. head. I'm like, yeah. this is crazy. I mean, yeah. like, what are we even oh, doing? <laughs> right. We get his like, heart out on guy, the table. <laughs> like, can this guy, I'm like, can this guy even live? Right. Right. And right. I mean, what was crazy to me, I had those thoughts going through in my head at the time. And then we finished and he stayed a lot. I mean, he's just getting poured units and units of blood and, yeah. and uh, I mean, injection of epinephrine into his heart. Oh and I mean, the crazy thing is the guy walked out of the hospital like three That's months amazing. later. And it was just like, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And I just, I'll never forget that because sometimes you wonder if what you're doing is the right thing. Yeah, sometimes, of like, are, you know, in, yeah. in medicine as gen- in general, when you're keeping people alive right. under these circumstances, but that was just an wow, illustration of like so... what the human body can handle and yeah, how people can amazing. recover from. Um, so they crazy just things. handed you the knife. Uh, They're like, <laughs> all right, second year, you're on. Yeah. <laughs> Let's I mean, go. They, they, they were right there and, you yeah, know, I yeah, just yeah, yeah, copied their moves on the other side. So it was, right. uh, Good. but it was still like, pretty uh yeah. i'm sure that's your like that's heart was jumping know, out of your chest uh, yeah. at that moment yeah. oh my gosh that's a yeah. that's a great that's story well. i love yeah. that all right so we need to wrap up but let's just quickly hear a little bit about your fellowship that you're doing right now yeah i really like general surgery and you know i had decided through residency that i didn't care to like go into surgical oncology or uh, transplant or some of the subspecialties off of that i like I'm, I'm happy doing general surgery as a profession, but I felt like a little additional training in what we call minimally invasive or laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery would be really helpful because I think the future of general surgery is really laparoscopic and robotic. Mm, right. And so I don't want to close any doors, keep right. options open. Yeah. Which is true and, to your uh, personality. You stay consistent. Yeah. 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 yeah but right. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So, that's really forward yeah, thinking so I, though. I too. chose that. No. So i uh, lucky enough to get a fellowship position at UC Davis so we didn't have to move our family nice. and stay here. It's a one-year fellowship right. and that also includes bariatric surgery 
surgery, which is weight loss right. surgery. Right, and which is so, really yeah. successful for That's a lot of people. That's awesome. And you, you know, right. you hear about it a lot. And yeah. then at the end of the year, you'll be taking a position back on the East Coast, right? Yeah, so I, I just Full signed an offer, yeah, to move back to the East Coast. So really exciting that time so exciting. Uh, for us. Yeah. You know, I have to mention, Rob, that I did watch a YouTube video of yours. Oh, you did? <laughs> you probably don't oh, even God. know it's on I YouTube. Did, I, I did not did, see that. I just did this morning. Um, and <laughs> it was on methamphetamines. <laughs> yeah, and Rob's laughing. He's like, oh, God, not that. Actually, I thought it was really good. And I learned a lot I like of the history oh. starting back in what 1890 or something yeah we have to put that link in the show notes for any yeah it's up on the uc davis surgery uh, youtube channel i think it sure is Um, yeah yeah but i just loved um, watching (laughs) well it's really informative i actually liked it but i also liked your boston reference when you said when you started going to stonehill that all the boston teams started winning (laughs) (laughs) and yeah coincidence (laughs) or we don't (laughs) it was all rob Uh, duran it wasn't bill belichick or or tom brady it was rob duran i'm not (laughs) no it's i'm not afraid to take credit (laughs) take the credit hey hey, we all take it when we can no i just love that but anyway you want to do some rapid fire yeah 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 real quick so oh, boy. Right. yeah yeah get ready no <laughs> they're not hard so yeah we have some rapid fire questions and here we go are you handy around the house or are you a duct tape kind of guy uh <laughs> boy i would say i'm As kind a general of surgeon we're just gonna <laughs> i'm in I'm going to go. I'm in between. In I will, between. I will, I try to do it. And then if it doesn't work too well, the duct tape. Okay. Uh, favorite thing to do outdoors? Uh, running. Yeah. You've always been a big runner. So I wasn't surprised. Okay. Chore you hate doing? Uh, loading and unloading the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> So it just and that's gets a so daily monotonous. Chore. Yeah, know. it just it so never old. ends. It never oh. ends. Yeah, I, me for me, it's cooking dinners, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> paper book, ebook, or audiobook. Well, and so I'd say paper book. I know it's hard to give up that paper book. Uh, favorite day of the week? A weekend off. Yeah, day. <laughs> right. Have Any day that's off is your favorite yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I understand that. Okay, so what food could you never give up? Uh, Thai food. Mm. Well, ah. the, there's really good Thai food out here, so it's going to yeah. be uh, hard to leave that. Find, yeah, I hope you'll you find, find it a replacement. in Portland. You'll find it, but mm, okay. Depends yeah, depends where you end yeah, up. Yeah, that's living. true. Portland has some good restaurants, mm-hmm. so I think we'll yeah. be okay. Right. <laughs> Okay. Um, name something on your bucket list if you have a bucket list. Oh God, yeah. There's too many things on okay. it. I still. Yeah. So I've been here eight years. I still haven't climbed Half Dome. So oh. I, I got to get that done before. That that's done. in Yosemite. Right. Uh, Time's ticking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to get that done for sure. Okay. If you could pick one superpower, what would it be? Boy, I had a really good answer to this a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, teleporting would be best. Yeah, teleporting that right. would be. I yeah, would choose yeah. that. Yeah, that's because God, Boom, I hate you're somewhere. like. Yeah, if I'm not driving the car, I actually get car sick, and it's really annoying. So, yeah. so you need to be able to teleport. Would be awesome. All right, yeah. let's, get, let's get on that superpower. <laughs> All right. Do you what? have a pet peeve? Uh, All right, I'll tell you mine. I don't know. Iceberg really. lettuce when I'm ordering a salad, and I think it's going to be like nice greens, and I get just iceberg lettuce. That's my pet peeve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty annoying. It's like, what is this? I yeah. <laughs> I'm blanking on all the things. Like, you know, my wife and I have, there's like a few things that really annoy each other that we oh. do. And I'm trying to think, but <laughs> I, I'm like blanking on them right now. I know oh, I have something. That's but pretty good. These are I like, could go on all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure she has more than mine. But. <laughs> All right. How about what's a pet peeve your wife has about you then? Yeah, that's oh, that. God. Oh, see, yeah, I remember all those because that's probably I've heard them enough. It's like if I leave clothes on the floor, oh, yeah. you know, that's like it's like the biggest deal. It's like, um, can't you just pick those up? It, yeah, the laundry yeah. basket's three it's feet. It's so up. easy. <laughs> and I'm like, but it's not a big deal. It's just right there. So yeah, I, I would. <laughs> I would say that's like one of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good one. All right. Are you a morning person or a night owl? I'd say more morning. Yeah, I'm going to say. I don't um, have a choice. 
I, I, yeah, oh. right. You, right. And normally, like when I had to get up with my kids and stuff, now if they're in college, I don't, but I had to be a morning person. But since they're out of the house, I'm totally gravitating towards being yeah. a night owl. How about you, Meg? I know you're a night owl. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I have to be a morning person right now. But yeah, if yeah, I had my would, druthers, yeah. I'd be a night owl. Yeah. Night owl, yeah. yeah. All right, Rob. Well, you made it through the rapid fire gauntlet. <laughs> yeah, and the gauntlet of being on our podcast. But thanks that, that so much, too. Rob, for coming on and sharing everything about your journey of becoming a general surgeon. I know listeners starting out or researching this are going to find it so helpful. So thanks so much, Rob. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, Rob, it's been fascinating. At one point in my life, I considered going down that med school path and I ended up in engineering, which is just the opposite of yeah. uh, where yeah. you went. And yeah. I have to say, I found this whole conversation fascinating and I'm really happy that you shared it with us. So have a great rest of your day. And yeah. Enjoy your long enjoy weekend. Your, enjoy your day <laughs> off and your last year out in California. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. You guys as well. Thank you. It was so interesting to learn about Rob's educational and career path and to hear firsthand exactly what it takes to become a general surgeon. Yeah, it really was. He is an impressive guy for sure. It's so hard to believe that he's been plugging away at this for 18 years. I I can't even imagine. And he just recently signed his very first work contract. That's amazing. It's Mm -hmm. such a long journey of classwork, boards, testing, clinical experience, etc. It takes a really special kind of person to make it through that kind of a gauntlet. Yep, it sure does. And Rob seems to be totally cut out for it. And he is an incredible surgeon. So yeah, and his patients are certainly lucky to have him. We are very appreciative of Rob coming on this podcast to share all of his amazing knowledge. We sure are. And I'm certain he helped a lot of our listeners who are out there considering a career in medicine or becoming a general surgeon. Yeah. I mean, he told you the facts and how hard it is, but he definitely loves it. So if it's your passion, you got to go for it. And thanks again, Rob. And thanks to all of you who support our show and listen every week. Yeah. Thank you so much. We could not be more grateful to each and every one of our listeners. And please don't forget to take just a minute to subscribe to our podcast and rate and review it. That really helps us out. Rate and review, please. It really helps others to find our show. It sure does. Thanks, everyone. And have a great day. Yep, have a great day.